Hello everyone, I am Azeel and we are in VR chat. Today I have with me two of my veteran friends, both of which worked on US Navy submarines. So uh, let's start with you. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm a spaceman squid. Like you said, I am a veteran, a submarine veteran, as as is he. I served aboard the USS Houston and the USS Michigan uh, from 2013 to, well, roughly 2015 to 2019. And then I served some time in the reserves, just sitting in an office. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Sin. I was uh, enlisted 2006, 2011. I served aboard the USS Tennessee, the USS Alaska. I was an electronics technician, petty officer second class, communications field. So my first question that I'm really interested in is, so there's not a lot of people doing this work. Like submarines are not nearly as big of an area of the U.S. military as most others. How did you get picked to do this job? It's a completely volunteer service. Yep. Completely volunteer. Oh, wow. Okay. So you said, I want to pursue this. And they said, okay, let's do it. Pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. Oh, you, you just go to the recruiter and, you know, they run you through what's available and you just kind of choose from there. And and what made you want to do this? Was it just like a childhood dream? <laughs> you want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> so in, in my case, I didn't necessarily go in through the recruiter going into submarines. I, I didn't even consider it at first. However, in recruit training, they brought a few of us into a room after getting basically a hands up of like, who wants to go check out what submarines are like? And uh, of course, I raised my hand because I mean, why not? It's time out of the training room, out of the compartment. What really won me over was that they said the food was better. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually true. That's actually yeah. true. I hope you don't and mind. It is true. Um, my dad was uh, sub submarines 22 years. He was on the USS Kentucky, commissioned it and everything. Um, one of his uh, um, cooks went on to be the personal chef for Bill Clinton back in the wow. 90s. Damn. Yeah. After that, he went on to run all of the barracks on the East Coast, I believe. Amazing. That's actually pretty cool. But the whole food thing, really, it, it owes to the fact that there's only one galley, one place where all the food is made on a submarine. So the officers get the same food as the enlisted, and they're not going to make crappy food for the officers. Yeah. So <laughs> Checks out, checks out. <laughs> that oh doesn't mean it's always great. It just means it's better. It's good enough that the guys in charge won't bitch about it. <laughs> well, it's also like they get these uh, meal prep cards and everything like that that are meant for, you know, X amount of people and everything. And uh, um, so on surface ships, you have way more people than you, you do on a submarine. So on subs, they can actually play with the ingredients a little here and there. And you get guys that are like one of the cooks on my boat was from uh, New Orleans. And so he always did all of the Cajun cooking. And oh, God, so it was lucky. so good. It was so good. I didn't get that. I wasn't lucky. <laughs> okay, so the food is good. Is the actual work harder? Like, are, is there a trade-off there? Kind of depends. <sighs> I guess responsibilities-wise, a lot of the jobs on submarines are a little bit of a mishmash of other rates or jobs in the Navy. Like, for example, I was an A-ganger, which was just a non-nuclear machinist mate or mechanic. And I did a lot of hydraulics and air and plumbing and like the CO2 scrubbers and the oxygen generators. And I ran the diesel and all of that, it can be split on a surface boat. You would see a split between, for example, engine men would run the diesel and they have their own A-ganger rate, but they do like specific jobs. And that's really true for a lot of jobs on submarines. It's just a mishmash of all of those all in one. I was going to say it used to be these jobs were split into smaller job fields, but over time, the jobs were combined. So like with my job, we used to be like four different job fields and they were just kind of like, oh, you guys aren't documenting all your stuff properly. Obviously, you know, you don't actually have a lot going on. So we're going to combine these four divisions into one. So on the submarine, you tend to have a larger scope of work, which means you have to be more educated on a wider range. Kind of. Yeah. 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 I'd say that. Let's actually start with what each of your jobs entailed then. I was a radioman. I did. Um, I was an operator for the exterior communications. So basically, sending and receiving all messages and everything, uh, maintaining communications while we were deployed and uh, on alert. Which is when uh, Ohio class submarine, which is what I was on, would go. When we went alert, we uh, um, basically cut communications to only receiving. We couldn't send, and it was pretty much passive. Other than that, we did um, electronic surveillance measures, which is counter detecting of radars and stuff whenever we're at periscope depth, and that's the majority of what we did and if i poke you later about different technological aspects of that how much are you probably going to be allowed to say 
Ask me the question. We'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Fair enough. It kind of depends. In yeah. his case, it definitely depends on what you're asking. And then how about your work? How much of that is, would you say, classified? Very little. Okay. Maybe maybe well, pressures, I would assume. I would think that the more detailed operatings of yeah. your systems. Like, I can't tell you how fast something spins or whatever, because that could lead to, like, oh, well, it spins this fast, so we can look for it this way. That kind of stuff. But for the most part, I make air. I pump water and poop. <laughs> and I run the diesel. Damn important work. <laughs> when the poop stops pumping, no one has a good time. <laughs> I've experienced yeah, actually. that. Oh. <laughs> Our gray water tanks overflowed <laughs> into the pilch. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, God. That was... Mm. Anyways. Um, for those that don't know, gray water and, and black water are different things. Gray water is like all the showers, the sinks, and the strainer for the galley. So strainer corn is actually a thing, and I have had it. It's not fun, Ugh. and it's not tasty. Ugh. And then black water is obviously all the toilets. Okay. And your job is just make sure that that stuff goes to the place where no one has to think about it except you. Yeah, that was one of my job aspects was to make sure it went to the tanks and then from the tanks away, out of the boat. So you guys jettison it? Oh, yeah. Okay. As long as we're, what is it, 12 nautical miles? Yeah, it's biodegradable. So 12 nautical miles out, you can pump whatever you want. Okay. Except for chemicals and yada, yada, yada. Yeah. Yeah, but, actually, yeah, yeah. here's a question. Both the submarines you were on were nuclear powered, right? Yes. Correct. So fission power, does it have any kind of negative effects on the environment around it if it's running correctly? No. Okay. No, it's generally actually safe. That's a common misconception people have because obviously because you've had incidents like Fukushima more recently, Three Mile Island, and Chernobyl is like the big one everybody remembers. Yeah. But people don't realize that in two of those cases, I'm not including Chernobyl because that was different circumstances, but in both of those cases, it was freak accidents, things that for the most part couldn't be controlled. In our case, it's all just, it's a contained system. It's specifically designed with a lot of safety measures. We've um, got extremely well-trained guys there yeah. and girls now. I yeah. got to remember that I got out like right as they were allowing females on submarines. So I'm still, I still say guys, fun fact, you get more radiation from eating a banana than you do standing next to the reactor compartment on a submarine. Wow. And flying. Yep. Okay. So we have some very smart people making this stuff then. That's <laughs> Pretty much. It's so bad, actually. So um, they give us a little uh, dosimeter, TLD. We call yep, it. the TLD. <laughs> they would call it a, the if magic, I can say this, a tiny little dick. <laughs> the, the magic zoomy blocker. <laughs> the magic zoomy blocker. But actually, if we were ever like flying somewhere to deploy or whatever the case is, you would actually have to hand in your TLD beforehand so that it doesn't mess with the readings. Because, I mean, if you go in a plane or whatever, you'll actually get a bigger dose and it'll throw it all off. And then they got to section you off and make sure that you didn't just get three different types of cancer, which they do They do freak out about. Yeah, the TLD uh, measures how much radiation you have come into contact with. Are there freak accidents, like you mentioned, that could cause that to actually be high? As in like from the boat or, yeah. or just like someone who's uh, none that I've heard of, to be honest. I'm, I'm not even sure. I mean, like maybe main seawater or not. Nah, I wouldn't even think that either. The, the closest thing I can come to is, which you've probably heard this before, is the submariner's curse, which is uh, <laughs> a lot of the, the married guys, for whatever reason, it was almost always true. They always only had daughters. <laughs> <laughs> no idea why it's so my, that people just called it the submariner's curse my dad broke that curse because he had two sons and then two daughters <laughs> but i mean we're me and my brother true, are both but... fucked up so <laughs> we both went on to become submariners yep hey whatever <laughs> okay probably the biggest topic i would want to ask about for this entire thing is how the hell do you survive being trapped in a tin can for that long with the same people dip sleep yeah <laughs> Tri it's just um, i mean when you think about it like it's the same roughly 150 people depending on obviously platform or whatever yeah but i mean you're stuck there get over it whether you you like them or not you have to work with them so you just got to be at least civil yeah. for the whole time and you can't afford to be fighting all the time you just can't you really can't. But also, I mean, it's such a small crew. You know, yeah. there's no point in fighting because it's going to get around and yada, yada, you know. And there's not enough people. It's not like a carrier where it's like 3,000 people on a big, practically a city. You know, you can't just pull someone from somewhere else on the ship and be like, okay, you're going to do this job and you go away. Like, there's only so much ship you can go at. 
I'm guessing you don't want to be the guy no one likes when there's only 149 other people, huh? Pretty much. Basically. Especially don't want the cooks to not like you. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, that's a bad time. Yeah, no. Co- cooks control the ship's morale because they're the ones that make your food. Well, you yep. don't f- with the cooks. Yep. Unless they're just bad, in which case you're not losing out. But if you're good friends <laughs> with them, you get to taste test all the cookies when they're fresh. Oh, uh, hell yeah. We had a cook actually on the Houston who uh, he joined on a bet. <laughs> no, for real. He joined on a bet. He he was like from a rich family and he put like a thousand dollars into a trust and his buddy put a thousand dollars in the trust. And the bet was that he wouldn't make it through a single a contract. Oh, wow. Yeah. He had a pet roach. Oh, my God. Yep. I actually didn't have much choice when I was joining. So my dad basically sat me down. It was like right before senior year. He was like, you know, you didn't do so hot so far in your high school career. Your GPA when you finish, even if you have straight A's, is not going to be high enough to get any good scholarships. So I'm going to give you three options. Take a loan and go to college and live here for free. Get a job and pay rent or join the Navy. And so, yeah, we went down to the recruiting office the same day. <laughs> And do you feel like it was overall a beneficial experience for you? <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, the memories I made are amazing. The people, the people that I met for the most part have been amazing. Submarines is a brotherhood. I've run into submariners that have been like, just they've opened their homes to me pretty much. You know, one guy, I, um, he was retired, uh, um, master chief submarines when we ran into each other on base in the uh, um gas station he basically looked at me and was like listen i'm retiring to puerto rico and uh i've got a house down there on the beach anytime you're in puerto rico come say hi you got a place to stay i was like oh shit, thanks that's dope yeah that's awesome what a community yeah no we <laughs> we look out for each other because it's a it's a small and tight-knit community it really is my boss actually was a nav et navigation electronics technician yeah same department as me, but opposite sides of control room. What does the control room kind of look like? Does it look like in movies where you've got like all the different buttons and panels, all that? Shit? Yes and no. Most part. I mean, if you wanted to break it down for you, like it's got switches and buttons here and there, some panels, you know, uh, readouts. Your older boats aren't going to look as like futuristic as you would see on like, you know, movies and stuff. But the Virginia class, though, cool. God, that was so cool when I was in there. Those are definitely cool. (laughs) That looks like it's straight out of a sci-fi movie. And they have joysticks. I know. You have to be E6 and above to qualify dive and drive. From what I remember, dive and drive on that boat, if I remember correctly, is also a chief of the watch. They've got a touch screen panel in front of them where they control all the stuff. So if I remember correctly, I got out in 2011. I visited the Dallas, I think it was. Most of the times, the only thing I heard of is instead of logs, instead of paper logs, they have like a little, like the thing you plug into your car to like get a code. It's basically that. Yeah. You just plug it into the machine, it downloads the logs, and then you're good. Oh God, you should see the diesel on it. Tiny little like, you know, 12 cylinder cat diesel. diesel. Yeah. It's wild. Yeah. It's literally, it's like, it'd be like the size of this room, maybe. No, it's, it's smaller it's, than you know, that. To explain some things, when you're on a sub, when I mentioned logs, you literally go around. Part of your job is not just like, for me, like I don't just work on all the hydraulics and all the whatever. Like I don't just work on the machines. Like eight hours of everyone's day is spent on watch, so to speak. And what that is, is you're just stationed at a thing that you may be qualified for. And for example, in my case, like auxiliary aft or forward or auxiliary men of the watch on a fast boat, which is a either Virginia or a um, Los Angeles class, you go around literally with a clipboard and a bunch of sheets of paper and you just write down numbers, pressures, tank levels, whatever the case is for eight hours. Yeah. Or six if you're on a particularly, you know, miserable boat. Eight hours of your day is just walking around every hour, writing down a bunch of numbers and making sure nothing's breaking or broken. They don't have like an electronic system that reports that all to a central server? (laughs) No. (laughs) No, because that would be too easy. Old school boats don't know reasons. (laughs) There, There are some things that have remote readouts, but even if they do, they still require us to check them in person at every machine. Computers can be wrong. Your eyes might not be. Yep. And that is the Navy's philosophy with a lot of things. It's trust but verify, just institutionalized. So it's eight hours of walking around up and down stairs and across compartments and through a watertight hatch or two and just writing down numbers and making sure, yep, this is running. Nope, this isn't running right now. Yep, this has the right pressure. Does that get to your head? 
Sometimes. The monotony. Yeah. It's not glamorous. It's definitely oh, not no. glamorous. Oh, no. See, I was lucky I with even... my watch. I, I had ESM, and that was only manned at Periscope Depth. So if we weren't at Periscope Depth, I was chilling. But when we went to Periscope Depth, it could get hectic. I'm, like, tracking targets left and right, yada, yada, yada. Like, we did a C-Sweaty that was just wild. A what now? C-Sweaty. It's a, um, I don't know what it actually stands for, but it was, like, anti-submarine warfare training where we had a cruiser, a ferry, and destroyer trying to, like, find us and, you know, sink us. Uh, it was, like, three days of that, and they had, like, P-3 Orions and, you know, anti-submarine warfare helicopters flying around, and, yeah, they never found us. When, when we don't want to be found, we're not going to be found. Did you ever have actual tense combat situations or near combat situations? Nope. In his case, that's very thankful. Uh, yeah. And in my case, not really. Yeah, there were moments like you could get counter detected, but it's really just you show up as a blip and then you're gone. And you know, you know when they when they find you. What What are the signs that you've been found? Loud noises. <laughs> I don't know much, much about um, it to be honest, because I that's wasn't a sonar in those thing. Rooms, so, but <laughs> it's, yeah, that's it's a, loud noises. That's a sonar thing. So unless they're pinging you with active sonar, then it gets wild. Ugh. That's we had so, something so similar creepy with sounding. A, yeah, we had something similar with a destroyer that they have like a toad array, and this is common like across multiple navies. They basically it's it's just a giant sonar array on a cable mm -hmm. for the most part, and it just pings actively. So the whole like you know on in movies where you have like the <laughs> kind of ping thing, yeah. that would be active sonar. Most of the time, it's all passive. We're just listening, chilling. Yeah hanging out we don't like going tearing. active because that makes it easier for us to be found yep because mm. it's literally you making a noise that bounces off of everything else but since you're making it you're emanating that noise it's really easy to track something down that's literally just screaming out to the world here i am yeah pretty much yeah screaming what's up this isn't exactly the ultimate stealth <laughs> technique is it you're pretty much just kicking in the door you know <laughs> yep pretty much oh my god these jellyfish <laughs> i know right <laughs> but yeah that's such a they always put that in the movies where the submarine just pings out to look, go looking for something and it's just not like that yeah it doesn't it's even sound like, like that. that we likened it to uh, um the old pervert from uh um, family guy <laughs> herbert <laughs> yep herbert the pervert you just hear <laughs> that's what, very oh very similar to what it sounded like <laughs> oh that's amazing it was wild, like trying to sleep while you're constantly getting pinged by that. Like, oh, God, impossible. Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> well, obviously, it's because it's loud and annoying, but also it's because it's different. Yep. Because if any submariner could say this, when when you're there sleeping and everything just goes quiet, you wake up yep. and you're like, what's wrong? What's going on right now? We like pretty much train ourselves to wake up when there's a change in the environment. Mm hmm. So like, well, you know, from being on the Ohio class, uh, there's a right in your rack above your head. There's a little like thing with a light and a fan. Mm -hmm. And anytime like we did like drills, they would switch um, electrical buses to basically only essential, shit, which, which would not include air conditioning. Yep. Which would shut that fan off and I would immediately wake up. And then like two seconds later, you'd hear the general alarm. Yep. Wow. And then everybody getting out of the racks and getting in their coveralls if they're not already. But <laughs> I hope they're not because that's weird getting to wherever it is you're supposed to be for general quarters yeah bro it takes me half an hour to wake up <laughs> oh no this is get out get your shit on and go and is a That's... lot of that just the training of like you have to know how to zap adrenaline into your brain in the right moment kind of like you just wake yeah, up in of. emergency mode you, you hear the alarm going you're so well trained to like okay i need to do this i need to do this i need to do this that's instilled in in every submariner from the start i mean the from the moment you step on board you are in the process of qualifying yep both to get your fish and to you know do other things other functions on the boat get your fish oh dolphin <laughs> Summary warfare Dolphin. pin. If you ever look on their uniform, like right around here, they'll have like the little two little fish and the submarine in the middle. That would be your fish. It's a it's a warfare qualification, and at least for submarines, it has like some sort of heritage, some meaning to it. Yeah. Of course, other parts of the service now have their own warfare qualifications and stuff, but it's I don't know, it's not quite the same. If you want, I can throw a picture of them in the chat real quick. Oh yeah, I can put that up on the video, so you will see it here. All right. And basically it's, you know, when you're getting your fish, you're not necessarily learning how to do just your job, right? You get taken around and you learn, okay, this is the general thing that this particular machine does. This is where it gets powered. You know, this is how you fight a fire. How do you 
combat what we call casualties. So anything like fire, flooding, uh, something blows up, whatever the case is, right? You learn to, as they say, fight the ship, which is just to be able to save anything you can in the event of like catastrophic failure, which the most important of which are being fire and flooding. There's obviously fire in an enclosed space. You lose air and also things break. And flooding on a submarine, preferred not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fire and water in the people tank are bad. Yep. <laughs> You'll notice that we have uh, um, very simple and dumb ways to say things because A, it's fun, and B, it just simplifies things. Yep. Get the information across. Yep. The people tank would be obviously inside the submarine. What I showed you was a, uh, basically what the submarine warfare pin looks like. It's a art design of it. But um, So, fun fact, and you're probably just going to be like, oh, the, what the hell, guy? I never actually got my dolphins. Um, really? I got all the way up through most of my quals. I was on a, um, what was it? Uh, compartment walkthroughs when I got medically disqualified. What? Yeah. They didn't my, even qualify you? My chiefs tried to get me in to get my dolphins, like get aboard. The command master chief, who was a piece of shit, fucking uh, um, blockaded it. and was just like, while I am alive, you will never have dolphins. I was like, oh, go fuck yourself, guy. He was, yeah. That's so lame. Yeah, despite being a tight knit community, you're still gonna get those assholes. Really? Yeah, That's that was a are. that was a <clears> wild <throat> situation because that was on the Alaska. They just got done with refueling and were like manning up crews and stuff like that. So I transferred from the Tennessee to the Alaska. I was having a uh, sleeping issues and like with that came depression and stuff and all sorts of bad things and that's why i got medically disqualified i don't know what your sleep schedule was like when you were a nub but mine was 36 to 48 up six hours down and those six hours were during drills yeah i didn't necessarily have a great time either as yeah. a nub nub being a non-qualified person that is someone without fish derogatory when, when you yeah it's a derogatory term <laughs> it really. is it stands for non-useful body or <laughs> new underway buddy uh, they're not they're not really <laughs> supposed to say it anymore but we still do <laughs> yep we still do and we still treat them mostly the same you know as a nub like you're not useful you can't stand any watches you can't really be trusted to fight any casualties you're not anybody really you're just there eating food taking up air and space so the imperative is to get qualified to study, get qualified and do at least something marginally useful like cranking, which is when you're working for the cooks. You can't even say that even anymore. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. They're FSAs it's, now. It's uh, FSAs. Food service attendant. Yeah. You can't call them cranks or nothing, you know, politically corrected that away. Yeah, they've um, done so much. So they used to treat nubs way worse back in the 80s when my dad was qualifying. He had stories of like, he'd go to get a checkout from someone. And if, uh, I think it was an A ganger, actually, if he got questions wrong, the guy would just kick him in the shin. Wouldn't send him away <laughs> to, to fix himself. He would kick him in the shin <laughs> until he got the question right. They duct taped one of the one of the nubs to the bottom of the uh, um, table in the the uh, cruise lounge. Oh my God. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all sorts of stuff that was that was that was hazing obviously it's not good but it was a prank but yeah they used to treat nubs oh. like way worse than they're treated now nubs now are treated almost like and princes even in my time we were treated fairly well growing up in 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 submarines like i wasn't allowed to watch tv or do anything you know other than qualifying so anytime i had to do something you know i wanted to do something to decompress and just get away from it all i'd have to like i basically crawled in my rack and just read from my kindle <laughs> yeah like that's what i did to get away i did everything in my rack if i needed to just like not work yep or not even focus on being in a basically a moving building with no windows but afterwards man i saw the nubs on on, on the michigan even they were like watching movies and stuff like that yeah and it's like man get qualified like then you don't have to worry about nothing. <laughs> I, I couldn't even eat dessert. They wouldn't let me have ice cream. I never even cared for ice cream, but I mean, soft serve's all right. I only wanted it because they made me not have it. <laughs> what was, what was, oh, God. I actually got in trouble one time for sending some nubs away with uh, lookups. Really? A lookup is like when you're getting a checkout, we've been talking about this and haven't explained this. When you're getting a checkout, basically you come to somebody, it's like a, there's like a piece of paper with your qualifications. It's basically like this system, you're supposed to say, you know, talk about this, this and that, and then a signature line with somebody who's qualified to give that signature. So you demonstrate that knowledge of the system. A lookup is like, let's say I ask you a question and you just don't know the answer. I say, okay, you're going to have to look that up, right? Because it's something that I feel like you need to know in order to fight a casualty or whatever the case is. And I actually got in trouble for sending a yeoman nub. She was from the Ohio. 
I sent her away with a lookup for something stupid. It was like, what powers the reefer plant, refrigerant plant? And she didn't know. I was like, okay, just go look that up. And then <laughs> her, her LPO lead petty officer, her LPO comes to me later. She's like, what, what's going on with this person? I was just like, I don't know. I sent her on a lookup. What are you talking about? And she apparently she was saying that I was being unfair or some stuff. What? I was like, okay, okay whatever. Oh like, my God. Cool. Great. Sorry, I didn't just give away a whole freaking checkout. It used to be different, man. You used to just show up and be like, hey, here's a Monster Energy drink. Let's just sign my Right? <laughs> it seems like the military manages to be like basically a bipolar parent. It is both excessively overprotective and does not give a fuck about you. Yes. Basically, yeah. It doesn't care in all the ways that it should. And then it, it is like insanely, insanely obsessive about certain things. Mainly procedure. Yeah. Actually, entirely procedure. Then they say that they care. And then you're like, well, I'm having a mental health crisis. And they're like, would you like to see the chaplain? It's like, I'm having a yep. mental health crisis, not a come to Jesus crisis. <laughs> yep. And the worst thing go, is, is that as soon as you do that, you are dead to the command. Yep. You go to mental health and you get kicked out. That's pretty much the oh pipeline. Oh, God. So it's a system of suppression. Kind of. More or less. It's partially just the way people come up in the Navy and then also just a natural reaction I guess people have. Because like I kind of I rationalize it on their part as like, okay, this person is basically not useful to me in the eyes of the Navy. So I don't really want to touch that no more. Like just get away from me, go figure yourself out and then come back when you're useful again. There's also the concerns of like, what if this person hurts themselves while they're deployed? Mm -hmm. What if they do this? Because suicide is a very big issue within the military, as you've touched on in previous videos. And the last thing you want is someone taking the watch, you know, topside sentry and going behind the sail and blowing their brains out, you know? Yeah. Yep. Happened. Boat next to mine, I believe. He had actually just gotten qualified out. and his guys wow. uh, hazed him. They did the uh, attacking on of the dolphins, which is where the guys would punch your, like your warfare pin into your chest. Typically not super hard. You know, it's like a, it was like a, <laughs> hey, good job, you know, that sort of deal. But uh, it's one um, of those things that started off as like, hey, good job. And then, you know, people being people yeah. just ended up taking it too far. Caving people's chests in with two by fours. Anyways, um, <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of idiots, a lot of idiots. Pretty much they did the tacking on of the dolphins. When somebody hazes you, you're supposed to report them. And this guy, I we don't know. We guess we he felt conflicted about the fact that, you know, his division did this and he loves his division. But at the same time, like if he doesn't report them and they're caught, they can all get like in a lot of trouble. So he ended up taking the topside sentry watch and putting an M9 to, in his mouth. Jesus. Who knows what else was going on behind the scenes, though? He might have had mental health issues to begin with. But at the same time, Yeah. It's an unfortunate thing, but it does happen and we have to watch out for that. And that's, I can understand from that point of view as to why they might fast track you out of the military for having mental health. But at the same time, it's like some stuff, you know, when depression is secondary to something else, like I'm depressed because I'm having severe insomnia, treat the underlying issue, the, the insomnia, and you can really, you can make me worldwide deployable again. And there's also the problem of like, if you say to someone who feels like their service is their life, what they care about, if you tell me you want to die, I'm going to take away everything. They might just not say it until it's too late. Pretty much. It's kind of what happened to me. My career became my life. I wanted to do 20 years. I got caught in the system with the whole mental health stuff. I was lost in the medical system three times while I was on limited duty. A, because my case manager disappeared twice, like just flat out fucking disappeared. So the first time he disappeared, he transferred from uh, um, the hospital in Norfolk. I can't remember the name of it, but he transferred from there to Little Creek and no one ever told me. So it was like a good six months before I found out where he went and I went and reconnected with him, you know, got started getting treatment again. And then he just disappears again. And that time he full on retired and went back to Kansas or some shit. No one ever told me. So it was like another six months, six and a half months, something like that before. No, it's actually almost a year that I was trying to figure out what was going on. And they got me a new case manager finally, you know, when they were like, oh, this is what happened. You're in limbo. I was like, yeah. Wow. Yeah. By that time, like I was coming up on the end of, cause you can only be limited duty for two years before you you basically get kicked out. So I was coming up on that and I went and I talked to who I needed to. I got declared a uh, medically fit for full duty worldwide deployable. I'm guessing that paperwork got lost in the system. At the same time, Obama was trying to, and I'm not blaming Obama. This is fucking Congress. Obama was trying to cut military spending. Congress said, we will not let you cut military spending without kicking people out. So he had a sequester and started downsizing the military. And I was kind of caught in that crossfire in a way. 
And so I got out, I got 15 days notice to get out six months before the end of my contract, seven months, actually. Yeah, that was horrible. I actually became horribly suicidal after that. I mean, I could see why that would be considering that your father, especially basically defined it as your calling. Yeah. Didn't give me much of a choice. Pushed me into electronics. I was a horrible electronics technician. I hated it. I, I almost failed out of a school, a school being our technical school. I almost failed out. Like I hated it. I was horrible at it. I should have done something like mechanic or some shit. But my dad being a retired nuclear ET, um, electronics technician, he was just like, this is what you need to do to make money when you get out. Where did that get me? Four and a half years of experience. Every entry level job wanted six years of military experience. Jeez. Anyways. <laughs> well, you medically discharged. Did you still keep your GI Bill at least? Yeah, no, I kept my GI Bill. I'm, I'm honorably oh. discharged for medical conditions. I cannot reenlist or anything. Um, if there's a draft, they cannot touch me. I would say that's a good thing right now, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, at least you kept your GI Bill, I guess. Yep. No, I used it. I got two degrees and now I'm an archaeologist. There you go. Yeah, that's such a, a returning to glory story. That's awesome. Because <laughs> I remember when we met, we met at a, a rave. I remember you were talking about that. And I was like, oh, that's fucking awesome. And then you mentioned that you were also ex-military. And I was like, oh, wow. So he actually has quite a bit of experience in life. Then. <laughs> I'm 35, if that tells you anything. Gotten a lot done for 35, I think. I've been around the block a few times. When I got out, I didn't go straight into being an archaeologist, obviously. My first job after six months of unemployment was like armed security and um, low-income apartments. I was a cook at Chili's for like almost two years, I think. And then I went to college. It always starts out that way, really, for people like us. We get out and we we find the first available job or try. I got out. I thought I had a job lined up in the shipyards and that fell through, I guess. I don't know. Unions. What are you going to do? Shipyards where? Over in Bremerton. Okay. I was going to so say, when you don't I got out, I was, yeah, when I got out, I was stationed in Bremerton, Washington. I had ended up there from Pearl Harbor. We decommissioned to Houston. And then from there, I was supposed to go to Portsmouth in New Hampshire? Question mark. There's like three Portsmouths. I don't know which one it was. Instead, they cut me to the Michigan, so. which was just a jaunt across the street, pretty much. And, oh, there's a jellyfish in me. <laughs> and from there, I pretty much just stayed there. And I got out and thought I had a job lined up in the shipyards. That fell through. So I started doing out outside plumbing. And that sucks. <laughs> I can imagine. That sucks. It, it wasn't as literally shitty as I thought it was going to be. But, like, digging in Washington dirt? <sighs> man. I don't know. I don't know. Wet dirt is just heavier. Yeah. Really. But, you know, just kind of going through that stuff and then getting out, I was just angry just in general. I mean, the last like couple years, I would I would yell at people and that's kind of fucked up to say it, but it's kind of the only thing I miss about working in the military is you don't have to worry about getting fired necessarily <laughs> if you're just a kid. <laughs> Also, and, I depending mean, I on was your just, rank, like yeah, I, I suppose so. Uh, yeah, you can get in trouble, but like they can't necessarily kick you out unless you do something absolutely egregious, like UCMJ breaking stuff. In my case, I was just like, "Hey, dirtbag, why the hell aren't you doing your job?" Like you know that kind of stuff, like just yelling at people for, or at least in my mind, for sucking. I never really yelled but, at anyone, only when absolutely necessary. I hate yelling. But what I found was that it was more effective if you never yelled at someone when you do finally yell at them. Because then they're just they're looking at you like deer in the headlights. Everyone's like, are you about to murder him? I can see that. I wasn't crazy about it like yeah. the first four or so years of my career. But I don't know, something something snapped. And then it was pretty much all downhill with my attitude from there. I mean, to the point where on the Michigan, we were changing Cobbs, that's chief of the boat. That's basically the head enlisted person on the, sh- on the ship. He was actually walking with P. Cobb, prospective Cobb. He was leaving and P. Cobb was coming in to take his place. They were both walking through the missile compartment. I had just got done yelling at the duty chief about not pumping sanitaries because I had been waiting <laughs> down in lower compartment, waiting to pump sanitaries for like an hour, like on phones with sound powered telephone on phones, just chilling, waiting. And I got tired of waiting and I went up there and I'm like, Hey, what the fuck is going on? And he just, he gave me that deer in headlights look. He's like, <laughs> what are you talking about? Like, we're not doing that for like another hour. I was just like, oh yeah, that's cool. You should have told me maybe like an hour ago. I've been on station mother- this whole time, motherfucker. Yeah. So I went up to control 
yelled at him and just about everybody in control and basically just went down one level and then aft through the missile compartment, literally just yelling the whole way in English and Spanish, both just yelling the whole way into <laughs> missile compartment. And I passed Cobb and Peacock and Cobb is like, whoa, 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 slow down, man. What's going on? And I'm just like, I'm just da 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 and these people suck and no one wants to do their job and da da da. And that was actually the first time I met my Peacock. That's the <laughs> <laughs> so that was his first impression. Oh. Oh my God. <laughs> but it was that sort of thing that just like it was just that pretty much for those last like two years in the Navy. And it was it affected a lot. It affected my relationship with the people around me. It, it eventually ended my engagement. And that basically led to me ending up almost homeless, living out of my car on base with my expired military ID, showering in the base gym. Oh, wow. That sort of thing. And I just, I worked that plumbing job and then I got another shipyard job through a contractor, saved up enough, put what little I had left in a box and shipped it over here to Georgia. And now I here, here I am. And now okay. I actually have a, a decent job too. Uh, you know, Good. I'm about to start going to school. I make way more than I did then. And I can actually live in a place. We mentioned that TAPS class and it's, so the TAPS class is, it's a week long class of literally how to be civilian, which is as horrible as it sounds. From what I hear, it's gotten better, but my experience was, here's how you write a resume. Here's how you write a federal job resume, which is apparently way different. Uh, here's yep, how is. you apply for this and this and this and this, and they just give you like a giant list of crap that you have to do. And they don't really explain anything, you know, which could mean the difference between getting a job and, you know, living in an okay apartment at first, or, you know, like in many cases, ending up homeless for a little while or whatever. And they just, like he said, it's just, here you go. Now there's the door. Have fun. And that's it. And that's all you get. If you're and, even allowed to go to TAPS. Yeah. If you're even allowed, because it's not even guaranteed. It's supposed to be a requirement. So something that I found out later, you can go to TAPS for, it's a TAPS stands for transition assistant program. You can go to there for a certain amount of time after you get out as well. I don't remember how long it is. I think it's like six weeks or something. I didn't even know that. Yeah, I didn't either. And they, they probably don't even make an effort to even bother with those people. Only when you have a good, uh, like a good chief or someone who actually cares. Yeah, that's rare. I actually did have one at my last command. My chief was amazing. I miss that guy so much. He was an A-gang chief too. <laughs> <laughs> Short little guy. My opinion of chiefs like completely drastically changed. I went to a, a DRB, which is, uh, what does DRB stand for even? Disciplinary review, review Board. A disciplinary review board. But basically... DRBs usually precede captain's mast, which is non-judicial punishment. You basically stand in uniform in front of the captain and a green table. I don't know why green. There's probably some history behind it. And it's basically, you did this. What have you to say for yourself? And then later they decide whether or not you get punished or, you know, whatever. But I went to DRB for having a phone in the shipyard. <laughs> which okay so it was for having my phone in the shipyard right but it was like i it was my phone that i took the camera out of you're not supposed to have a camera phone in the shipyard the real story like what happened was 3 a.m i'm standing rover topside roving watch yep when we stand topside watches it's a petty officer of the deck and a topside rover and that's it also called the, the topside sentry yes and they're basically the the first response for any dangers coming to the boat when you're in port but i was standing rover sentry and uh it's like three in the morning i needed to take a shit. no one got up in like an hour of waiting right so i'm like all right cool it's the shipyard it's three in the morning no one's gonna be awake i'm gonna go to this little building that's you know a bathroom and i'm gonna take a real quick shit, right mind you i'm armed that is definitely not okay in accordance with you know navy doctrine so i go in i take my gun off i hang it on the hook i'm taking a massive dump i mean huge the biggest dump on my life at the time and a chief from the corpus christi walked in and right at that moment my phone goes off and i silenced it like instantly and he said nothing he just like did his thing in the stall next to me walked out i get my stuff i finish i wash my hands like a good boy and uh he's standing right there waiting oh, for me no. outside oh no and there i am gun and all and he's like come with me a couple days later i go to this drb and Every single one of the chiefs that was there from my boat just like broke me down as if I was the worst person alive in the Navy. 
Yep. I mean, one of the senior chiefs, senior, well, I'm not going to say his name. What he said, he literally grabbed the sheet of paper from the printer in that office and crumpled it in front of me. And he said, that's your integrity. You just, you can flatten it out all you want, but it's never going to be a, a flat piece of paper again. That's your integrity. I was just like, come on, man. Like, yep. I already told you, yeah, I had it. Okay, great. But like, where was my relief? Where was this, that, and the other thing? I got off easy, thankfully, from all that. But that treatment... That sort of thing is one of the, the checks in the boxes of things that just led to my downward spiral. Into in, disgruntled in sailor. The, just, into just the disgruntled E5 A-ganger, yep. which is typical, really, of A-gangers. Pretty stereotype. Yeah. <laughs> can't believe you were playing to the stereotype. I Yeah, whatever. <laughs> At least I didn't smoke and do dip. Uh, huh, that's good. I smoked. I definitely but... drank a lot, though. Yeah, same. Well, you both made it out alive, even if... It was by a hair, and I'm glad to hear that. What led me to hate Chiefs was uh, <laughs> my uh, my chief on my, uh, my actually, it was my chief, the radio chief on my boat, was a piece of, a real piece of work on Gold Crew. <laughs> Funny story of going into submarines while having a retired submariner father was uh, um, I go into radio for the first time, and the senior chief sitting in there was the guy that made chief with my dad. So he instantly, he knew who I was, like just... Look, turn around, saw the name, unique name. He's like, is your dad this? I was like, yep. He's like, I got you, man. Like in a, I got you brother sort of way, you know, he was awesome. Yeah. The guy that was relieving him was a piece of shit. He's the one that like put me on a really f***ed up sleep schedule. But, um, almost every chief on that boat served with or under my dad. So jeez, <laughs> Yeah, that was, uh, I couldn't escape it. So the chief of the boat on the blue crew got fired. When I say fired, he got told to retire. They want a namesake visit, which is where um, you are hosted by the like city or state that your ship is um, named after. And they'll like basically pay for a bunch of your guys to go on quote unquote vacation, I guess you can say, to that state, like the main cities and stuff. But you have to do things like you got to go to a baseball game in uniform and do this and this and this, you know. So they were doing a, a namesake visit. And I believe when they were in Nashville, the uh, command master chief the cob he got in trouble for shoplifting and i'm gonna leave it at that oh yeah and running from the police oh my god we were deployed when this happened we were getting we were getting the sit reps and everything like that reading and going he did what what <laughs> <laughs> he got um, fired they were like do not pass go you're retiring now that's what happens when you're e7 and above and you're fired you're just told to retire Exp even with officers so his replacement was a master chief who was a nub on my dad's boat. And my dad treated the nub like a nub, you know, back in the eighties. And, uh, he held a grudge. As soon as he saw me, that was game over. He did not like me and he treated me like shit. And he let me know he made my life a living hell. And when I was transferring off that boat, I was supposed to have orders to the Florida, but, um, he found out, got them pulled and got me orders to the Alaska, which is where his best buddy was the command master chief. So I get my orders and I get there and I meet the new command master chief. And he's like, yeah, so-and-so told me about you. And he made my life mm -hmm. a living hell. And that led me into like the real bad depression. Cause like, not only did he treat me like shit, like he was hands-on treating me like shit. That's some yeah. shit bagger right there. Yeah. What I found out later, like when I got off the boat, was the chief's quarters was actually doing everything they could to find out how they could get him fired. Wow. Yeah. When the chief's quarters turns on a chief, that's a bad day. <laughs> that is a bad day. because They never do that. It's like a fraternity within a fraternity. Yep. Even if they hate each other, they'll be best friends outside the chief's quarters. So my chief on the uh, goal crew for my, my first boat. The chief's quarters was trying to figure out how they could get his anchors taken away. They weren't sure when he was made chief, so they weren't sure if he was getting paid it yet. And if he wasn't getting paid it, they were going to try and get him taken away because they did not like him. Once you make E7, getting demoted below E7 almost takes an act of Congress. That's why they typically just like get out of the Navy instead you of demoting him. You have to murder somebody. Yep. In severity, that's what you have to do. Pretty Unless, much. of course, like he mentioned, you're not getting paid that rate yet, which the yep. way it works in the Navy is you make rank whether it's by a test or whatever the case is, you make rank and there's an up to six month window where you're not getting paid that new rank. You're still getting paid whatever you were before. There's other factors that go into it. Like if you're, I think it's like top 10 percentile or something like that on the exam, then like- Yeah, you, then it's um, sooner. Yeah, then it's sooner or it's immediate or whatever. If you're oh. capped, that's when the captain comes down and says, you are now this rank. It's immediate. Actually, um, a lot of my debt that I still have now was because they took more than six months to give me my pay. 
Oh, fuck. From E4 to E5. So E4, I made it on the test. And they're like, okay, you're in E5. Get out of the barracks and apply <laughs> for BAH. So I was like, all right, cool, great. When do I get the BAH? Oh, you get it when you get paid E5. Yep. All right, cool. I went to DRB. They put me on suspended bus, right? Which is just like, I can't wear E5, but they didn't take it away from me. If they would have reduced me in rank, basically they I would have gone from being an E5 all the way down to an E3. So that's a petty officer second class all the way down to or a fireman in my case. Yeah. The reason why is because you're still effectively an E4. Yeah. So if you get busted down in rank, you're going to go down to an e- E3. But I went to DRB, all that happened. I got effectively a slap on the wrist. And then nine months later is when I got my first E5 paycheck. All that time, I had to be in an apartment because they literally kicked me out of the barracks. And I was pretty much just paying rent, paying my car payment, and eating ramen or boat food. Yeah. Yeah, when I made E5, um, I made it off the exam. I don't know how I made it off the exam with like the skin of my teeth. I didn't even been on a boat in over a year. Like I was fixing them, but like I wasn't, I hadn't studied for it or anything like that. I, Cause I was just like, I don't know what my future holds right now. So I, I didn't even think I was going to make E5, but I made it. And I was like, holy shit, that happened. Did so, you Christmas tree? Uh, no, I mean, <laughs> I, I have great test taking skills. I envy you so much. What I found is sometimes uh, um, when you have multiple choice exam, anybody watching this can use this. Sometimes when you have a multiple choice exam, you'll notice that um, a question further down might answer a question that you're currently struggling on. So if you're ever struggling on a question, just move past it. Don't waste your time on it. Come back to it later. Not only might it answer it or it could um, jog your memory on what that question was. Absolutely. I lived and died by the phrase, when in doubt, Charlie out. Oh, God. <laughs> that is just to answer C on the question. <laughs> yep. Yep. No, so so I somehow made E5, skin in my teeth. Whenever you make the next rank up is also dependent on your PRT. So you'll take mm-hmm. a, PR, a physical readiness exam after that. Like the it's Navy wide. If you fail that, then you're not going to get ranked up. Or yep. they might hold your rank until you pass a PRT. And so that's what they did to me because I actually, during the run, I sprained my ankle really bad. But like I went to medical and they refused to like give me a waiver despite the fact that like I had a fucking sprained ankle. I couldn't run bastards. on it. If they had waived it, I would have made E5, right? Yeah, on time. But so I ended up, it was like next spring when I actually got pinned. Wow. You know, they don't do sit ups anymore. Really? They do planks. <laughs> yeah. Oh. It's push ups, planks, and then cardio, not just run cardio. Yeah. Be running biking or swimming if you're a psycho well i mean it still is the run jump and puke but still <laughs> the run jump and puke i like that That's you never good. heard of that no <laughs> that's what we used to call it back in the day the run jump and puke because most of the time when you show up for it, you're hung over <laughs> <laughs> we actually we had a guy uh, show up to pt in a school who was hung over as hell oh, oh man <laughs> they basically made him run with like a gallon of water and just drink it as he went and he was hurting <laughs> so bad and just vomiting all over the place <laughs> <laughs> do you have any like weird people either on the boat or in a school or anything like that i mean third dime a dozen the navy come on yeah i mean okay fair we- enough <laughs> fair enough but uh, you're an et so you had a few more of them <laughs> i mean our boat had an a ganger that we call box which meant it was short for dumber than a box of rocks <laughs> that was a special guy i'm not naming names okay oh, anyway man. he was a short kind of stocky guy you know like but not like muscle wise and this guy would come up and ask you a question and you'd answer it then he'd ask again because he had no idea what the fuck you just said <laughs> <laughs> he got stuck in the engine room down in a um, shaft alley basically there was some he was cleaning he was a part of sparkle team and he was cleaning back oh. there to get us ready for ORS, um, o- Operational Reactor Safety e- Exam. Exam, yeah. He was cleaning outboard where, along the um, hull, and he slid down, because I guess he dropped something, so he slid down along the hull and tried to go behind some like pipes and got stuck. What a, what a dumbass. Like his belly got stuck. <laughs> it took them almost an hour to get him out. He was proud of this, too. He would tell you this story like he was fucking proud of it. I'm like... <laughs> 
box shut up they brought in all the cutting tools they were going to cut the pipes and stuff to get them out and shit you know because they just could not get them out when finally the a-gang chief just had this brilliant idea he brought a tub of tourmaline and just lubed them up and popped them out <laughs> oh my <laughs> tourmaline i hate tur- i hated tourmaline so much but oh god tourmaline. it's a type of grease <laughs> yeah it's like this it's like this really purple and smelly grease and it stains everything. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Oh, he man. literally greased him up and yanked him <laughs> Greased and popped him out like a greased pig. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Man. Also, for those watching, uh, when I say A-gang, That's actually, I, yeah, I should probably let him explain that because he was an A-ganger. So a-, a gang is it's an older term which really stands for a, like an auxiliary uh, machinist mate. So anything that wasn't the nuclear power plant and and was mechanical is what we owned and everybody just calls them a gang although now that's also being phased out for some stupid reason because oh, there's no gangs in the navy. <laughs> there is no war in bossing say. Typically <laughs> And I don't really know why. Well, actually, I do know why we get the hate, so to speak, for being some of the dumber people on the boat, even though there were plenty of like geniuses, like, what are you doing in a gang kind of people? But yeah, it's true. We had a guy go to a critique because he didn't know what omit meant. (laughs) (laughs) A critique is when you fuck up and they're like, okay, we're going to explain to you exactly how you up and that's your punishment he went through a procedure and basically the thing was do this if this applies omit step whatever and he still did step whatever oh. because he didn't know what omit meant oh my so God. naturally something fucked up and they had the critique and that was his explanation and they go okay we had plenty of people like that yeah. you know like just didn't know a stupid thing or whatever or miss something super dumb which i understand why they kind of freak out about it but like you know most of the times it's like okay you know now you know don't do the dumb thing no more that's a marine trapped in a submariner's body right there (laughs) yeah i mean i already told you why they call a squid right no say it again say it again it's it's just a marine acknowledging a higher form of marine life (laughs) yep there was a guy on the houston and actually he did end up in the news and i think later on i'll I'll put it in the discord he actually was convicted for murder i'm not gonna say his name you can look that up later on but basically as far as the story as as i remember it because i haven't read it in a minute he went to college before joining the navy and at some point i guess he had some beef with his professor and tracked him down and killed him and i think almost killed the professor's wife oh wow and got away like the case i think went cold for a minute joined the navy and then ended up on my first boat on the houston and uh, i mean he was a weird dude he, he was a an ft a fire control technician so where he looks at stuff that's around us and you know sonar figures out the math for where stuff is fire control basically pushes basically is the ones that pull the trigger for all intents and purposes there's a little bit more to it but they're the ones that pull the trigger the torpedo yeah. men load the stuff the fts shoot it so he was a ft and uh he was a weird dude like the kind of like the cheese on teeth kind of weird dude and when we moved port from Pearl Harbor to Bremerton for decommissioning, this dude was missing, like missed ship's movement mm-hmm. entirely, gone. Mm-hmm. One day, uh, this is like a month or two in, I think, if I remember correctly, a month or two in, our cob goes to his chief and is like, hey, where is this dude? I need to see him about something. I don't remember what it was. And his chief literally looked at the cob and was like, who? He's like, what do you mean? I thought he was gone. He literally thought that this dude had transferred off the ship and that's why he wasn't there. Turns out this dude was just like for at least a month or two before we moved Homeport, he had been getting up early. His roommate was also on our boat. He had been getting up early, getting in uniform and leaving and going who knows where. And then he would come back later on in the afternoon. And this is how he missed ship's movement because he wasn't going to the boat. Yeah. So he didn't know none of this. So I guess he just carried on walking out and coming back. So finally, you know, the question gets asked, hey, where's so-and-so? I don't know where he's at. They call him up. He's still in Hawaii. And they're like, oh, okay, cool. So they flew his ass to Bremerton and kicked him out of the Navy. And a couple years later, I hear he's been convicted of murder. (laughs) Oh, my God. Where the hell? I guess he was present or accounted for. (laughs) Fuck. No, so whenever you were no, I morning, wouldn't even yeah. say that. <laughs> well, he was like he was accounted for. Yeah, I suppose <laughs> because he wasn't on the roster anymore. <laughs> I so yeah, that's makes so. Sense to me, I mean, except for the fact that he murdered someone, that's brilliant. <laughs> that's 
a hell of a sentence right there. Uh, yeah. I mean, we had a guy when I was in A school, um, my roommate actually just disappeared for two months. Like right when they cut off his pay is when he finally came back. You know, I was always getting at question like, Sin, do you know where so-and-so is? I was like, I have no idea. I haven't seen him just like you haven't, you know? And then one day I just, I walk into my room and there he is. Wow. He got his, kicked out. He was almost deserter. Worked. So that's amazing that the key still worked. <laughs> so we, what we found out was he was living off base um, in a hotel room with his crackhead girlfriend, just doing drugs and shit. Oh. And, uh, uh, um, oh yeah. There's all sorts of stuff like that. You do see drug usage in the military. Oh, absolutely. Like we had a guy, um, we caught him in another. This is, I, I also served before Don't Ask, Don't Tell, mm-hmm. like got repealed. They started talking about it while I was in, but they never. So um, just to preface this, we caught a dude. Uh, they were supposed, two guys, they were supposed to be in class, but they weren't. What was it? The duty chief and the duty section leader for the our A school, sub school, but went to a, a random room inspection during the day. So they're hitting random rooms and shit. And they walk into his room and just find him in bed with another guy, cuddling butt naked and an eight ball of cocaine on the table. Oh, <laughs> damn. Spicy. That was two reasons to get out. Do not pass go. God damn. Yep. I don't think the one I have can top that, really. <laughs> oh, Did I've you hear heard... about the seven that got kicked out of nuke school for playing Diablo 3? I've heard we actually had a um, nuke waste in our uh, was it, show up, and he was actually, if I remember correctly, kicked out for a while. Kicked out of the nuke school for a while. Yeah. <laughs> nuke waste, for those who don't know, is anybody that failed out of nuclear power training. It's actually one of the hardest schools in the military. Like, yeah. not trainings, but school. So you got harder trainings, like, you know, SEAL training is obviously harder. Ranger training is obviously harder. When it comes to schools, nuke school is like one of the hardest. I mean, I guess that's kind of a good thing. It's a year and a half of just like... Of math. Yeah. It's a year and a half of f***ing math. Math. <laughs> like particle physics and shit? Yes. Wow. All sorts. It's dumbed down for the most part and very specific to reactor physics, mm-hmm. but it's math and theory. I don't do good with theory. Math? Yeah. I'm cool. I can do that. Theory? Not so much. And it's not like multiple choice questions either. What is this? And you have to write, you have like a whole space to write the answers on. Oh, yeah. I was actually about to bring up the the ones from before, the, the Diablo 3 kids. When I was in nuke school, we all got called out to a public mast, which is basically the captain's mast that we mentioned before, but public. Normally it's not. It's not like a big publicized thing for a command or whatever. It's just you, the captain, and whoever else might need to be involved. But this was a public one. And it was the whole command. So everybody that was in school at that time get in uniform and get information out in like this big circle circular area, right? And the public mast was for a group of, I think it was like, it was nine individuals. It was two female, seven male. Uh, I'm being specific just because like that's Navy terms, yeah. male, female, whatever. It, that was the numbers there. It was seven, seven male, two female. And the captain, the captain of the command starts going off about playing video games and how you could do, you know, use your time better and stuff like that. And really the story was that it's like early in the morning. These are not necessarily co-ed barracks, right? If you're male or female, you cannot go in the opposite gender rooms. Like the threshold is as far as you go into the room. And, uh, and so what happened is, is these people were all having a fun little party in one of the barracks rooms, right? And they were caught. Several of them were underage drinking. The other ones that weren't underage were supplying. And one of the girls was enjoying five of the dudes. Oh my God. And the other one with the rest. And they got caught by like, I guess, you know, a duty chief or somebody, uh, somebody that was just making the rounds, making sure nothing crazy was going on. And they got caught doing this. And somehow they either hid it or something. They made it that they were playing Diablo 3 really late at night and just having a party or whatever. So that whole aspect of that incident just got completely brushed under the rug publicly. (laughs) And they all got kicked out or very heavily disciplined for the whole underage drinking thing. I went Um, to an open mast for 36 people. I got to hear this. I got to hear this. Yeah. I got to hear it. I got to hear it. So, um, well, I uh, graduated from boot camp, but I was put on hold waiting on my submarine waiver. You know? Yeah. It was basically for my glasses and my 
Oh god, the waiver was just sitting on some lieutenant's desk gathering dust Nerd. for three months. When I was still at boot camp, but I was graduated. We all were, so we weren't recruits anymore. And uh, but we still had to um, abide by you know the commanding officer's standing orders on the base. There, one of those standing orders was we weren't allowed to have a cell phone. Gross. Um. Yeah, I know. At that point in time, end of September two thousand six. Grad- I actually graduated the day after my nineteenth. Or yeah, my nineteenth birthday. That sucked, but so there was a massive push at that point in time to get Master at Arms into the Navy, which Master at Arms is the Navy's version of military police. And uh, they recruited so many that they didn't have anywhere for them to go after boot camp because the the Master at Arms school was full. We had a shit ton of people. I think it was almost 900 people in this holding unit. And it was all one barracks. And we had all of our bunks like all pushed together. And like you had barely fucking shoulder room between some some bunks and yada, yada, yada. It was it sucked. But there had been there had been incidents where people because we were allowed to go off base and stuff on the weekends you know there was instances where some people had gotten cell phones and brought them back and were caught with them and you know got in trouble well somebody was walking by somebody else's rack and there was a cell phone sitting on it and they reported them you know and the captain was so fed up with us and our cell phones that they were just like health and comfort inspection the entire fucking unit health and comfort inspection is where (laughs) the master at arms and everyone gets together and they go through everything they tear the place apart looking for contraband and stuff and they found 35 more cell phones (laughs) and the captain (laughs) was so pissed off that she held an open mast and made all of us go like everybody in the holding unit go stand out in the freezing weather in chicago in our dress blues and watch these guys get kicked out of the navy for having cell phones i don't know what the the demographic breakdown was you know ratio male to female i just remember being pissed off that i had to be out there i was getting punished because they are getting kicked out for having cell phones i was so mad i was laughing my ass off during our i couldn't help it i was watching people just drop because they were locking their knees and passing yeah. out while standing in attention this and was, then just laughing at a captain going diablo three <laughs> this was november november and fucking sucked, dude. great lakes up it up just That's north of freezing. chicago no fuck it that. sucked there was like three feet of snow on the ground or some shit <laughs> And then there's the innocent stuff you see. Well, I mean, innocent for the most part, like watching a Gumby, a Gumby, some dude dresses a king and a dude dresses a dragon just chasing each other around the <laughs> barrack. I, I don't know how to explain that one, really. Oh, it it happened. I, I was walking back from Domino's and, and there I was like Gumby, king, dragon, lightsabering down the way. The class ahead of mine in, in Radio A school had a guy um, get held back because the night before graduation, he decided to underage drink and he was <laughs> um, he was caught chasing people around the barracks, like the top floor of the barracks, butt naked, trying to tackle people. <laughs> <laughs> so i told you about the one roommate that like disappeared for t- yeah. a while so he came back and he was a an absolute like just creep for a while to the point where i couldn't sleep at night because i could just feel him fucking staring at me and the reason why is because i turned him in for a, um he uh, wouldn't shut up at night like it'd be like fucking two in the morning and he's just drunk and on his fucking cell phone talking to someone like real loud so they moved me out of that room and into another room with some people i knew we had a rotation going on of people like who buys toilet paper you know it was just a nice little thing we did for each other well one of the guys was just like well i'm just i don't want to buy the toilet paper anymore and we're like well then you don't get to use the toilet paper you know if you're not going to contribute he wasn't using the toilet paper but he was still in the bathroom oh Oh, that's gross oh that's so gross eventually we were like you know what is he what is he doing is he just like jumping in the shower and washing his ass or something every time he he takes it like that's weird okay whatever until one day during a room inspection like this wasn't a random inspection we would have like a room inspection every friday (laughs) oh yes oh no they they come in when they walk in like so we'd been living in this room and when you live in a certain environment you get (laughs) nose blind to the smells you know so they come into our room and they immediately go, the f- it's, that smells like, sh-. what is that? <laughs> then they start looking around. They're like sniffing, like, what am I? Sm- what is that? <laughs> and they like track it down to this dresser and they open the top no. drawer. He had been wiping his ass with his towels and just putting them <laughs> into the top drawer of his dresser. Mom found the sh- drawer. <laughs> Case in point, oh. going nose blind to things. One of the things that we use on the submarine to make our air clean for us to breathe <laughs> is called monoethanolamine, and it smells like cat piss. 
and yep. it permeates everything. You do go nose blind to it after like the first day or two. But my That's god, so getting that smell out of your uniforms, it takes like up to a week. <laughs> like oh. Yep. Just washing and air drying. Anything like, you have that's white, like white t-shirts or whatever, after some time, they actually do get stained a little bit like beige, yellowish color. Yep. Yeah. Just from sitting there, not even from wearing or anything like that. Just yep. In, it's in the air. They get infused. And that, oh, that's man. the price of refreshing your air, basically, so you don't just <laughs> die of CO2 inhalation. You know what the worst part is about that? Is so, it's not even uncommon. No. It's no. not even uncommon. There were so many people that were just disgusting. Why are you like this? I almost body slammed my my first roommate in my apartment because uh, we were smokers. You know, we smoked inside. And uh, this guy never learned how to take care of himself or anything like that. Or how to clean. Even though he's in the Navy, he didn't understand, like, cleaning your apartment, you know? So he knocked over the ashtray one night. And I was like, oh, shit, let me go get this stuff and, you know, the vacuum and stuff to clean it up. And uh, um, he was like, no, it's okay. And he starts rubbing the ashes into this carpet. Oh, and I about... My- body slam i was like what are you doing that guy was a weirdo that guy i hate to put it this way but there really are just a lot of those people that just slip through the cracks oh yeah because i mean just a fact of the nature of the navy and really the military as a whole is they have quotas and ultimately someone's performance as a recruiter depends on how many people they send to boot camp whether or not they make it through doesn't matter ultimately but they're supposed to be weeded out in boot camp but for the longest time there they weren't and so that led to a lot of just people that shouldn't be in the military getting into the military now that's why you hear incidences of like ships colliding with each other and you know bad command climates yada 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 that was because of the the rush like during Iraq and Afghanistan wars to just get people in. And, and so it, they really it, loosen it really the standards. Does, it really does lead to things like that. And, and, you know, not to say anything about the individuals themselves, but they, I mean, they would literally put people that were criminals or people that were legitimately like on the autistic spectrum for real, like a hundred percent, like how did you get in kind of thing? Like they, they just let anybody in and consequences be damned, whether that, you know, ends up hurting that person or somebody else. I actually got a kid uh, um, kicked out of the delayed entry program not that long ago. I'm not going to go into details why it has to do with a minor who's Ah. also my cousin, but he also was uh, um, on the spectrum and had a severe stutter and everything. And he wanted to be a mineman, which a mineman, they search for underwater mines and like that and have to deal with explosives and shit. And as soon as I found out all these things about his particular issues, I was like, I, there's no way I can allow this guy into the Navy. Yeah. Like, I, I have to do something because he's going to get someone killed. Yeah. And it's unfortunate, but I yeah. mean, it's exactly that. Like, how are you supposed to communicate effectively? You know, in, in that particular case, how are you supposed to do that? How are you supposed to actually function within the Navy? Interior communications is hella important when you're deployed. That's something that we learn as submariners and everybody learns is that you need to be able to quickly, concisely, and and effectively communicate what's going on during an emergency. So much so that there's a manual on it. Oh yeah. None of this like, you know, talking over each other, yada, yada, and the shit going down. The man in charge does all the interior communicating and then you communicate with him and you need to, you shut up and and you only say what you need to say and that's it. And it it comes down to even certain phrases and stuff is what you're supposed to use instead of just, you know, casual talk. Oh yeah. Like, I it mean, is down to important. even the dumbest thing. Like if you need someone to wait a second, it's not just, hey, wait a second. It's wait one. Yep. Done. That's it. Yep. Wait one. Pure efficiency. Stuff like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the and issue is when you're in the heat of the moment, you don't need someone taking like 30 seconds to say what could be said in two mm-hmm. because that's valuable time. Uh, when you're doing, when you're communicating what's going on, you're communicating with a DC cent, like damage control central, and they need that information as fast as possible so that they can, you know, do their thing. Yep. So they can um, coordinate people and resources to whatever the emergency oh yeah. is. Oh, yeah. And even when you're like, say, your nozzleman, like you're on the fire hose and your nozzleman, like just being able to be like, all right, water on deck. All right, water up. All right, fire is contained. You know, simple phrases like that just for us communicate a breadth of information that most people would just take it at face value. Like, okay, great. But it could mean we're done fighting the fire or, hey, the flooding has stopped. I have a bandit on it. You know, we're good. Proper repeat backs are so important. Oh, yes. That's where, like, if I were to give him an order, he would repeat it back to me. So I know that he understood. I don't know how many times is the helm I heard 
wrong. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I never heard that. I I sat home once. I never heard it. That's just when I was qualifying it. I never actually had to sit it for extended periods. Lucky you. I know. God, I'd fuck that. You. <laughs> when you're sitting Driving. home. You've Go got ahead. helmsman and planesman. Helmsman like steers the boat left and right and makes minor depth changes. And planesman is the one that makes the major depth changes. Yep. So um, like you're always in communication with like the chief of the watch, the officer, the diving officer and the officer, officer of the officer deck. Of the Whenever you're given an order, you're just like, all right, what would be a good example? I can't even, it's like come left uh, to whatever heading. Yeah. It's like helm, steer, whatever degrees to course, whatever. And you just repeat, you know, helm, right, 30 degree rudder. You know, I'm just making up numbers at this point. 30, yeah. right, steering course, blah. I, sir. And if you repeat it or right, okay, you're good. You just carry on doing whatever it is you were just told. That was like the bread and butter of everything in the Navy. It doesn't matter what it was. It yeah. could be something as mundane as, you know, pumping sanitaries, driving the boat, whatever it is. Repeat mm-hmm. backs, repeat backs, repeat backs, repeat backs. Does it drilled into you after a while? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It also becomes natural to know, like, when I need to do it and when I don't. Because sometimes you can just uh, um, reply with just I. But it, it, it was very contextual. And that's just something you learned because it, in a sense, it is a cultural thing. Yeah. In the Navy. For like <laughs> casual talk, you know, or, or a casual thing like, hey, go do the thing. It's like, I, okay, I'll go do it. But in the case of, for example, from a watch to a watch perspective, that is like, you know, the officer of the deck saying something to the helm or whoever, it was a repeat back. So well, that, another fun thing that major difference between submarines and surface fleet in every other branch is how we address each other so if we're on watch we're on duty yeah we use rank or title or whatever off that no we're just unless you're a chief or like an e7 or above you just use last names or first names yep. if you're on good but like if you were really tight knit if you're at like a unofficial function like someone's throwing a barbecue or something like that now you're on first name basis with everyone yep oh, even your, your chiefs Someone- i remember you talking about how your video of the gunner's made that thing went down. So something that active duty needs to keep in the back of their mind is that when you're doing anything PR and talking to a zeal is public relations stuff, doing interviews, anything, you cannot disparage the military. You cannot talk bad about your command and everything. And I hate saying that, but while you're active duty, your first amendment rights are very restricted. Now I'm not giving legal. I do not misconstrue this as legal advice or anything. Okay. But you can be charged under UCMJ Article 134, which is the, we all know that one. That's the general article. That's anything that brings disrepute to the military. Yep. But if your command is particularly petty, they can get you with Articles 88 and uh, 89. 88 would be dissent against the U.S. government, basically. Yep. Typically, that only applies to commissioned officers. That is but a terrifying law name. 89 is when you offend your superior officer. You could literally get kicked out for talking bad about your superior officer. So you need to, I love you all, be safe, just be careful when you're talking, all right? Yep, it, it just said, oh my God, I can't believe I'm going to say the the forbidden words. To piggyback off of that. <laughs> oh God. Okay, <laughs> chief. Okay, chief. <laughs> Don't curse me that way. <laughs> um <laughs> But um, what he says is true. I I know, obviously, we have our opinions. We're not, you know, we're not in anymore. I don't want to say we're safe necessarily, but, you know, like. Oh, Navy can't touch me. Yeah, we we can't necessarily be touched. (laughs) But the thing with active duty is you guys have to be careful whether you like it or not. The military, I mean, in general, like you still got to watch out for yourself, guys. We have only a semblance of an anonymity in this game because these are our voices and people will recognize them. If you want to find someone in one of my videos, you can probably do it for basically every single one. Like, if you really try. Don't, but, you know, it's possible. Just be so, safe and be smart. Just watch out for yourselves. Again, whether you like mm-hmm. it or not, you sign that contract, put up with it, and then when you get out, you can say more or less whatever you want on your own time. I mean, we've seen it now already. His video wasn't the only one that's you know that it's happened to. There's been plenty of other military people that have put out information and then gotten a big slap on the wrist or even worse for less and even that gunner's mate didn't even really say anything but you know somebody somewhere is going to take it the wrong way Mm -hmm. and you're going to find yourself standing in front of the green table or whatever the case is for anyone else any other branches so just watch what you say 
keep in mind that we say this because we love you guys and we we want to make sure that you're good i learned that the hard way and i'm not even in yeah <laughs> tell me a story i want to hear it you might think it's boring but i'm interested Boring, but I'm interested.